found, or the speed of light. The amplitude of a wave is how far from equilibrium it extends. Harmonic waves, or sine waves, form a regular repeating pattern. The frequency of a harmonic wave corresponds to how many times each second a particular spot goes through its repeating cycle of motion. The corresponding wavelength is the distance over which the pattern repeats. The distance for the repeating pattern in space and the time for each cycle are related to each other through the wave velocity. The time it takes one full wavelength of the wave to pass a given point is the same as the time it takes that one point to go through one full cycle of its motion. Thus, for each harmonic wave, the product of the wavelength and the wave's frequency must be equal to the wave velocity. So a wave with longer wavelength must have a lower frequency. Shorter wavelengths have higher frequencies. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions here. One from, uh, I, I'm sorry, Adian. I, I can't, Adian. Uh, he says, is light harmonic? Well, so when we're talking about sound waves, when we talk about harmonics, uh, harmonics are multiples of a frequency. So I press, was it middle C is 440 hertz, uh, and a harmonic of that uh, is 880 hertz. In other words, it's a doubling, there's a tripling and a quadrupling. Those are called harmonics. And harmonics are very pleasing to the, to the ear. And, and the question is, is, is do light, does light have harmonics? And the answer is yes. Um, very, very high frequency, and it's not really how we usually talk about light. We usually talk about just the, the prime frequency of it. But, you know, the, the oscillations of light and the oscillations of sound are, are exactly the same. They're both sine waves, as you see there. Both are sine waves, and they have wavelengths, and they have frequencies, and they have speeds. Um, and, and so Matt asked, if the waves don't carry material, how do we transmit electromagnetic waves into space or just on Earth? Yeah, so this was uh, this was something that people have struggled with for two thousand years, um, and where we've come up with is that uh, the universe doesn't consist of stuff. Really, it consists of uh, of fields. What's a field? Uh, so we we're familiar with the gravitational field. We jump up. There's not a spring pulling us back down to the earth. There's something invisible that pulls us down, okay? And that invisibility is, is this gravitational field. Uh, the same thing is true with, uh, with electromagnetism, which is light and radio waves and everything we'll be talking about. It's a field. We can't see it. We can't taste it. It isn't a thing, but it, it, it exists in space and it makes things do stuff. So if there was an electric field around me and I was charged, I would be either moving towards it or away from it two magnets there's a there's a field between those two magnets you can't see anything and and there it is and so light is just taking those invisible fields and moving them okay and it's a hard concept to understand because it, it it violates common sense but it's the way our universe is, uh, works okay so this is this equation you really need to know the wavelength which is that the length of one of those oscillations times the frequency, how often it goes up and down, is equal to the velocity, which in, this, in the case of electromagnetic radiation is always the speed of light designated by C. And this makes common sense if you think about it. If you have something that um, has a wavelength of one inch and it oscillates 10 times a second, then it will move 10 inches in that second, okay? So wavelength time frequency equals the velocity, which is true for all waves, and it's equal to C, the, the speed of light in terms of electromagnetic radiation.
So we can't perform experiments with stars and galaxies. When you're, when you're taught in elementary school, what is science? science? They always say, well, you have a hypothesis, you perform an experiment, and then you either prove or disprove your hypothesis. That doesn't work with astronomy because we can't do experiments with stars and galaxies, but we can observe them with electromagnetic radiation. Why do I use the term electromagnetic? We use the term electromagnetic because it's an electric field oscillating with a magnetic field and both of those fields move with the speed of light. Uh, so the, uh, the, the way beyond the scope of this course, but a changing electric field will induce a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field will induce uh, ele an electric field. And this is exactly why motors work or generators work. So every time you turn on a motor, uh, you're using this changing electric field makes a magnetic field and vice versa. Anytime you use a, an electromagnet, you're, you're doing that. A changing electric field creates a magnetic field. Uh, anytime you turn on a light, that light is turned on because there are generators moving around converting electric and magnetic fields into an electric charge that moves down that wire. Let me show you a couple of uh, demos of this. Oh, shoot. I have to remember to change my sharing. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here is a series of electromagnetic waves. Uh, and the and notice that it's a disturbance. So the up arrow refers to the changing magnetic field. It's not some it's not a thing that is moving, it is a field. And so just like in a gravitational field, I feel this attraction towards the earth. If I was a charged particle right there, I would feel uh, an attraction that would be, depending on my charge, upwards or downwards. And then the, uh, the magenta thing there, I'm sorry, the cyan, uh, cyan thing there, that's the magnetic field. And again, if I was a magnet, I would feel a force left and right. But notice that there, nothing is moving here, but the propagation of the disturbance is moving, just like we see in water waves. And this propagation of the disturbance moves at a, uh, um, at a speed of C, at the speed of light. Okay, and let me show, huh. So where is the other one? Hold on a second. Yeah, here we go. And here is a close up of one of those electromagnetic waves. And this, uh, the, the green line refers to the uh, wavelength of that electromagnetic wave. And you can see that it's moving uh, to, in this direct, in the direction of uh, going towards the right at a speed of C. So let's go back to here. Notes, sure. Okay, so an electromagnetic wave could be placed on a graph because it has an X value and a Y value, or is that just a representation? So Matthew, yes, definitely an electromagnetic wave has a position in space. Um, and I could measure when I see a light path, if I had sufficiently um, precise instruments, I could measure the increase and decrease of the electric field and the increase and decrease of the magnetic field as that light wave passes through uh, my position. And it does have an orientation. It has an X and a Y orientation. That is real. Uh, and in fact, uh, for those of you that wear polarized sunglasses, the polarized sunglasses makes use of this fact by only allowing light that has a certain orientation through and doesn't allow light with other orientations. And the reason the Polaroid glasses work is that when sunlight hits the surface of things like water, it rotates the angle of the electric and magnetic field. And so your Polaroid glasses will transmit light that comes from the sun and stop light that has been reflected where the, uh, the X and Y axis of the magnetic and electric fields have rotated. That was a good question. 
uh, any good question, any question I can answer is a good question. Okay. Uh, and so here's electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation comes with a whole series of, um, uh, of wavelengths and frequencies. And notice that for if, as the wavelength gets short, the frequency has to go up. Because remember, the wavelength times the frequency has to equal a constant, which is the speed of light. So as the wavelength gets shorter here, so we have increasing wavelength, which means it's a decreasing frequency. So radar, radio waves have a, a wavelength of about a meter, okay? And the frequency is very low. Up here, gamma rays have a wavelength of 0 0.0001 nanometer, 10 to the minus nine meters, and it has a very high frequency. So wavelength times frequency. Um, now, sometimes you'll hear the term uh, photon to refer to electromagnetic radiation. Um, photon is, uh, in real life, uh, electromagnetic radiation is packed up in little bundles that we call photons. Um, that has to do with quantum mechanics uh, beyond the scope of this course, but for the purposes of this course, when you hear the term photon, think electromagnetic radiation. Um, what is the farthest known exploration of a known telescope? Uh, that would be the end of the universe. And we'll talk about that in a later lecture. Why is one on one plane and one on a perpendicular plane? Um, yeah, that's just the way our, our universe is made, that a changing electric field will generate a changing magnetic field that's at a 90 degrees to the changing electric field. And a changing magnetic field will generate a changing electric field that's at 90 degrees. That, that's, that's just the way our universe is built there. I don't know if there is a why. How is light both a point and a wave? Well, actually what you mean is how it's both a particle and a wave. Um, so I hate to keep saying this. There are some things I'm just gonna to have to say that's the way our universe is built. To, to, and there's really no understanding. You can, you can get a further knowledge about it by taking a course in quantum mechanics. Um, but why that is, you know, why does our universe consist where on, on our level, on our day-to-day -day level, everything seems like it's nice and smooth. But if you look closer and closer, things are chunky. They're, they're made up in atoms. And if we look closer and closer, everything is chunky, including light. Uh, everything is made up of, of little tiny pieces. And in, there's even a theory that time and space themselves are made up of little tiny chunks. So we don't know why that is. Does the lack of gravity effect in space have an effect on these wavelengths and frequencies? Absolutely not. Okay, so all electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. What is light? Light is a strange thing. It isn't just what we can see. Light can be broken up into different types and we call the whole family the electromagnetic spectrum. So even when it's dark, light is still all around us. Light can be created by making an electron oscillate. This creates an oscillating magnetic field and an oscillating electric field, which we call an electromagnetic wave or light. We often represent light as a wave. Just like water waves, light has a wavelength, a frequency and a speed. The different colours of optical light have different wavelengths and so does the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays are the most energetic, whereas radio waves have the least energy. Even so, light is the fastest thing in the universe. In a vacuum, all light waves, even radio waves, travel at an incredible speed of 300 million meters per second. The Royal Observatory is overrun with squirrels. They're hard to miss during the day because they reflect visible light from the sun, but at night it's more difficult. However, they do emit infrared light and if our eyes could detect it, we would be able to see them in the dark. If we pass high energy x-rays through them, the squirrels look very different. Humankind has invented lots of different instruments to show us what our eyes can't see, like our great equatorial telescope, which captures huge amounts of light and allows us to see objects that are tens of millions of trillions of kilometers away. We can see matter interact with light and change it. The gases in the Earth's atmosphere scatter blue wavelengths of sunlight, giving us blue skies during the day and red skies at sunrise and sunset. We can watch sunlight reflect off planets and the moon. 
During a lunar eclipse, red sunlight changes direction as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere and reaches the moon. And although visible light from stars can be absorbed by dust in space, we can detect the infrared light, which gets through to see baby stars hiding in nebulae. which is no longer true. And we'll get into that when we talk about black holes. Uh, lost sound, really, shoot. Um, yeah, should have, should have had sound. I love the British accent, yeah. Okay. So uh, we got that. The universe doesn't speak English, it speaks frequency. I think that's cute. Um, so here's the different types of electro Magnetic radiation. Yeah, that's weird that the sound broke out. Anyway, you can hear me now, right? Um, so you'll be responsible for the different types of electromagnetic radiation. And this is in order. So gamma rays have the shortest uh, wavelength, the highest frequency, the highest energy. X-rays, the next highest uh, is slightly longer wavelength. Here, the wavelength is 10 to the minus 10 meter. There, it was 10 to the minus 12 meters. X-rays, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 8 for ultraviolet. And then visible light is 10 to the minus 6. That's what we can see with our eyes. Infrared, which requires infrared uh, telescopes, goes down to 10 to the minus 5th. Uh, and visible light here. So here's gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, and radio waves. And here is the wavelength of it. Uh, and notice that the visible light, the light that we see that goes from red to blue is a tiny, tiny sliver here. And blue light has the shortest frequency, the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, highest energy. Red light has the longest wavelength, the visible light, uh, the lowest frequency and the lowest energy. So blue is high energy, red is low energy. And this is kind of weird because we often assume that that blue re represents cold and red represents hot. But in fact, it's the, exactly the opposite, that blue represents higher energy and red represents lower energy. And we'll be talking about that in the next lecture. Where did microwaves go? We're going to get to microwaves. What about violet energy? Does that have more energy than blue? So, uh, Alex, I actually, uh, violet is a very interesting problem, violet and purple, because they're not colors of the rainbow. Uh, it has to do with uh, human color vision. Uh, read my book. Uh, I wrote a book on human color vision. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So microwaves here, wavelengths of about centimeters. Um, this image here, we'll be talking at great length about this when we talk about the universe. This is the cosmic microwave background. This is the echo of the birth of the universe. Uh, the radio waves, uh, you know, we use radio waves for our cell phones, but we also use radio waves to discover the universe. Here are some radio telescopes. Uh, and that's why when fire gets really hot, it turns bluish. That's correct. So blue hot is much hotter than red hot. Does invisible light also carry a certain amount of light energy? Yes. So all electromagnetic radiation carries energy. And in fact, here it is. So here, frequency goes up, wavelength gets longer, and energy goes up. So as you go up here, it's higher energy. And energy is directly proportional to the frequency. So as the frequency goes up, the energy goes up. Energy equals frequency. So wavelength times frequency equals the speed of light. And you most definitely need to know both of these equations. Again, you will not be calculating with these, but you need to know them. Okay. Uh, and so down here, uh, radio waves, visible light is, is right there, that single line. And then up here, infrared, I'm sorry, visible light is right there. 
ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays is up there. So gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and then microwave and radio waves. Okay, so that's the introduction to electromagnetic radiation. We'll be covering electromagnetic radiation. Uh, is that why cops and Navy use red lights while working at night instead of white or blue because it's harder to see red light because the higher wavelengths and, oh boy, Brett, um, I could do a lecture on that. Um, so it used to be that we thought that I, I, yeah, I, we, we actually have two visual systems. We have the black and white system we use at night, and we have the um, color system that we use during the day, what they call the rods and the cones. And back 50 years ago, they thought that if we used red lights in cockpits, that that would not affect our night vision, which we need to look outside the airplane and make sure nobody's out there trying to hit us. Turns out they were wrong, but that, that will take us far afield. Uh, I thought the Planck length was seriously likely the smallest distance. What does that have to do with energy? Uh, this isn't the Planck length, it's the Planck constant. Those are two completely different things, although they're named after the same individual. Would you be in the dark if your eyes are sensitive only to x-ray? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's problems there. We'll talk about that towards the end of this lecture. Okay, so the question is, We've talked about electromagnetic radiation, but to, for us to explore the universe and actually for us to walk around our house, we need to be able to see things. And by see, I mean, we need to, to convert reality into images, into a two-dimensional representation. And we do that every second, every millisecond through uh, the mechanism of our eyes. Our eyes takes reality, goes through our eyeball, converts it into a two-dimensional representation on the back of our eyeball, and then our brain interprets that. And we have two two-dimensional representation, and our brain tries to make sense of that and tries to create a three-dimensional reality for that. But that whole structure is reality to image, okay? I call this angle to image. And we need that for our eyes, but we also need that for telescopes to be able to understand uh, the universe. And so we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about uh, angle to image. So imagine a cow. Now, again, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Illinois. So that's what we had, lots of cows. And the question is, can we take this represent this cow, a real cow, and convert it into two-dimensional representation? I've done that by uh, showing an image of a cow on two-dimensional plane. This plane could be the back of the eyeball. It could be the back of a camera. It could be the, uh, you know, a telescope. Uh, and so the question is, how do we do that? How do we convert the cow, the real cow, into a two-dimensional representation of the cow that we then can either interpret with our brain or convert into a big digital stream in our camera or our iPhone. Well, there's four ways to do that, okay? And you really do need something here in the box to do it with. Uh, because if there was nothing in the box, every single component of the cow would take the light that is bouncing off of that ear and hit all parts of this two-dimensional plane. From the hoof, all of the light from the hoof would then hit all parts of the two-dimensional plane. And so every component of this plane would be hit with light from every component of the cow, and you just get a mess. You wouldn't be able to see anything. So what you need is a way of just separating the light. And the simplest uh, is called camera obscura a pinhole camera. So the light from the ear of the cow goes through a pinhole and only the light from that angle where the ear is will hit that part of the, um, uh, of the image. And this camera obscure or pinhole camera, this concept's been around for thousands of years. I mean, the ancients used that to create a very dim image on the back of walls of, of, uh, of a room, okay? Uh, and you can see this in operation at the North Carolina Museum of Art. It's out in the field. Uh, it's called the cloud chamber. You walk in here, um, close the door, and you can see on the floor of this room uh, a, an image of the clouds that are passing overhead because there's a small pinhole right there. The, the problem with pinhole cameras is they're very, very dim. And uh, so it's dim, it's very low resolution. It's dim because all of the light from the ear, you're throwing away except one particular stream of light. 
And the question is, has, is there any animal that uses pinhole camera imaging? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, all sorts of mollusks and the, uh, the uh, nautilus, which you see here, use a pinhole camera lens to, to, to view the, uh, the, the universe. Okay, another way to do that is instead of pinholes, you have a series of baffles. Uh, and the advantage of, of baffles versus pinholes is now you can make these baffles somewhat bigger. Uh, but it's still, you're losing a lot of light. And notice I'm using the term photons, where I really mean electromagnetic radiation. It's just photons are easier to say. So for the purposes of the course, photons and electromagnetic radiation are synonyms. Um, and has this ever been used in nature? In fact, it's by far the most common form of of imaging in, in, on the planet Earth because it's what insects use. Compound eyes are really a series of cone baffles to direct the light into different parts of the image sensor, okay? Uh, and here is a blow up of, of a compound eye. Uh, they're very small. Uh, and you can make these compound eyes as small as you want, which is why insects like them because insects are pretty small. Uh, disadvantage is they have very poor resolution. So insects in general cannot see very well what they, and they make up for that by being super sensitive to motion. Okay. So if you, if you're standing next to a, a fly, the fly cannot tell whether you're smiling or frowning, but the fly can certainly tell if you're moving. Okay. So the problem is all of those two methods we've seen throw away most of the light. And when we're dealing with the universe, we're dealing with very, very dim objects. We can't throw away any of that light. We need as much light as possible. So we've got, you know, the light from the ear of the cow and the light from the hoof of the cow comes out from the ear and the hoof in many different directions. And so the question is, can we take the light that comes out in many directions and put it in a single part on the image? So I take the light from many different directions from the ear and collect all of those light beams and put them all in a single part in the image sensor. And that way we've made use of all, uh, as much light as possible from the different parts of the cow. That's fine, but the problem is to do that, you have to bend the light, which we didn't with those previous, uh, the, the, the compound eyes or the pinhole camera, we didn't need to bend the light and here we do. And the question is, can we bend light? And the answer is we can, and we, it, it is, it's a vulgar, it's a, it's, it's an interesting point that when light hits a disparate surface, that it, it, it will change its angle. So a light that's coming in from one material and going to a different material will change the angle that it hits. Uh, so let's see if I can uh, bring that up. Yeah. Okay. So new share. Physics simulations, share. Okay, so here is a bending of the light. So the light beams uh, come from the top of this, uh, 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 top of the um, candle, and it goes through here, and it goes through uh, what we now call a lens, and that lens will bend light and the bending of the light depends on where on the lens you hit. Okay. So let's uh, go back to here. Shoot, where am I? Okay. Ah, that's what I wanted. Okay. So let's get back to this other simulation. So if I turn on this light beam and I move it, as we go between, in this case, air, and uh, in this case, water, the light beam comes in, and as it comes down, it's reflected at the same angle it comes in. And so angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But if it actually goes into the water, it bends, okay? 
And the amount of bending it's called is, is proportional to what they call the index of refraction. So different materials such as glass and water will bend material at different rates, okay? So here, if you're going through a piece of glass, it will bend at a different angle. And we can use this fact that light can be bent, it's either through reflection or refraction, to gather all those photons from a particular part of the cow into a single part of the image. Okay. And let's go back. So, and we can bend it two ways. As you can see, we can bend it by either light going into an extra material, usually glass, or we can bend it through bouncing off of material called reflection. So we call this refractors and reflectors. And there are telescopes that are made with both ways. Light travels outwards from a source, bounces off of objects in its path, travels into your eye and onto your retina, where it forms an image. If your eye had no lens, light from a single source would hit your retina in lots of places and result in a smeared out mess, which is exactly what happens when I take the lens off of my camera. A lens focuses that spread out light, corralling it into a crisp image on your retina. And after a little excitation of light sensitive nerves and interpretation from your brain, you see. But wait, when we look at an object, the background and foreground are usually blurry, because a lens can only focus light coming from one distance away. If an object is too near or too far, its light will again be spread out on your retina, leaving you with a blur. Fortunately, muscles in our eyes allow us to accommodate by squeezing the lens, which changes its focal length so we can see at different distances, except when we can't, or when our lenses become damaged, in which case we need glasses. Unlike a lens, a pinhole or other small opening can focus light coming from any distance. Because it's such a small opening, it only allows light to come through in one place, and thus in only one direction from any particular source. So there's no blur, and everything is in focus. If you're familiar with photography, this is why using smaller and smaller apertures makes everything in your photo come into focus. Of course, small openings like pinholes and camera apertures create crisp images by blocking rather than focusing light, so the images are much darker, which is a major reason why we use lenses rather than pinholes for glasses, telescopes, and eyes. And yet, in a pinch, looking through a tiny hole made with your fingers can help you see. Now do you see why? Cute. Uh, let me answer some questions here. Um, would you be in the dark if your eyes were sensitive only to X-ray wavelengths? Yes, because there's not a lot of X-rays floating around. Is this similar to a shadow? No, Gracie. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Are there any creatures that can see light behind beyond humans' visual spectrum? Most. So uh, the different animals uh, on the planet all have different ranges they can see, not hugely different, but slightly different. So for instance, uh, bees can see in the ultraviolet. Uh, are there any, cre uh, and in fact, the most amazing creature, uh, again, this comes from my textbook, um, is what's called a mantis shrimp. Our eye can only see three different colors and the, the, the millions of shades that we think we can see are really just combinations of those three colors that the three types of sensors we have in the eye. The mantis shrimp has 10. So the mantis shrimp can see, can perceive colors that are literally incomprehensible to us. Um, are there higher or lower frequencies beyond the electromagnetic spectrum? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's very, very low frequencies all the way down to zero frequency and very, very high frequencies. Uh, we just call the you know frequencies that are incredibly high, we just call everything up there gamma rays, regardless of how powerful it is. Do binoculars use the same technique as a telescope, just on a smaller scale? Absolutely. Binoculars, telescopes, the, your eyes all use the same concepts. Okay, so now let's get into uh, astronomy. We'll get into telescopes. Uh, so refraction is where we use lenses to bend, we use glass and the different index of refraction of glass to bend the light. Um, and there's problems, as you saw in the video, first of all, and unlike the other techniques, you actually have to focus. Uh, and so things that are only at one distance will come into focus. It doesn't really matter for astronomy because everything is very far away. Uh, another thing is that uh, unless you shape the lens very carefully, the different parts of the lens will focus the light beams to slightly different parts 
uh, of the what would, should be the image plane here, and this is called spherical aberration. One of the biggest problems is that just like a prism, the index of refraction of light depends on the frequency of light. So for instance, blue, which has a higher frequency, will bend more than red, which has a lower frequency. And so that means that the blue and the red will, uh, will focus at, at slightly different parts. And this is why in cheaper cameras are really the, the early um, uh, cameras on our phones, you would often see color fringing around objects. Uh, this is a very big problem and, and that's why people spend a lot of time and effort um, trying to uh, fix this problem. Uh, coma is where different parts of the image plane come to focus. And so there's a lot of difficulties with, uh, I, I could just go on and on, with focusing using mirrors. And we call it the diffraction limit. We'll talk about that in a bit. The solution to the image problem is have very complex shapes for these pieces of glass, and that's very expensive. Or uh, more particularly, where you have multiple uh, lenses, multiple uh, um, pieces of glass that are shaped with different shapes and with uh, different materials to remove all of those different types of problems that you have with glass. So for instance, you know, this uh, telescope lens has somewhere between 20 and 25 lenses in it, okay? So, uh, and the eye is one version of this, and the eye has a lens that's just not very good. Um, but it has a, 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 a lens right there, and it has the imaging plane, which we call the, uh, the, the cornea in the back of the eyes. In fact, let me show you a video of that. So, so there's the human eye, there is the lens for the human eye, and then this is the imaging plane, which is the retina back here, okay? And the lens isn't very good. The image plane, the retina is curved and it's really kind of messy. Our brain, we don't notice that because our brain tries to correct for all of the problems with the, uh, uh, um, with the eye and the lens. Okay. So here we've got light coming in. It goes through the, uh, the cornea, the, the lens of the eye. It comes through the iris, which you know, uh, opens and closes to me in the amount of light. And then it produces the 2D image on the back. You can see it coming through. And uh, this just is an illustration of the things we saw before. And there is the retina, and we have rods and cones, which, you know, we just don't have time to talk about, sorry. The rods are for the black and white vision that we have, and the cones are for the, uh, the color vision. And the rods and cones are all um, gathered together in the fovea. And so we have this incredible... Um, uh, perception, but only in one part of our vision, and the brain tries to to map everything else. But again, that's a that's a whole different topic. So let's uh, go back to astronomy. Uh, so will electrical and other later generations of telescopes improve on that uh, and make them even better than they are now? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that in this lecture. So mirrors. So instead of bending it with, with uh, glass, we can bend it with mirrors, basically curved mirrors. And so if we have a curved mirror in the shape of a parabola, it will focus the light on one point. But you can see the obvious problem here is that if you have it straight on, the sensor itself will block the light that tries to get to the mirror. And so you have to have things offset, which is kind of a pain. Um, and there's great advantages with it. You don't have the spherical aberration. You don't have the chromatic aberration. And instead of 21 lenses, you only need one object, one curved uh, mirror. And it just greatly simplifies things. And you can mount it on the back versus having to mount it on the edges. So if you wanted to create a really, really big lens, it would sag if you made it you know, 10 feet across. Whereas with a, a mirror, you can mount it on the back and it wouldn't have to sag, okay? 
disadvantages, like I said, the image plane is, you know, the light has to come in and it's obstructed by the thing that's creating the image. Um, and you need to clean the mirror periodically. But because of all of these advantages, virtually all astronomical telescopes are mirrors, not, uh, ref not what we call refractors. So these are reflectors as opposed to refractors. Refractors are like your eyeglasses, like lenses. Um, yeah, per are these how periscopes are? Periscopes are kind of like binoculars. They have a series of flat mirrors and then they have lenses on the, on the, on the edges. Uh, an astronomical telescope has a curved mirror to focus the light, okay? And so here is one of the larger telescopes. That's a person right there. This is, I think, a, a, a this is a classic 10-meter uh, telescope, so that would be 30 feet across. And the light comes down. It's focused to another mirror there, which then comes back down to the image camera right there, okay? So refractor. It's more expensive. Here's my, uh, um, here's the uh, telescopic uh, lens I was telling you about. Nice thing is about refractors, they can double both as refractors and as um, things you can drink out of. So refractors are more expensive. They're not very compact. They have a lot of uh, problems. And reflector, I can't see space vampires, that's cute. Uh, let me show you. Uh, to here. So here is a refractor. Refractor takes a lens and it, it bends the light and comes out through the eyepiece where you look at it. A reflector comes in and it reflects the light, hits another mirror, where you go to the eyepiece there. But notice that the light, the amount of light that you get is cut down because you have to, you have this uh, secondary mirror in the place. Okay. Um, another problem with astronomical telescopes is the Earth moves. And so I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but you have to have a mount that moves the telescope in real time because it has to map up with the rotation of the, of the celestial sphere. Uh, and we have different ways of mounting that. We have an equatorial mount, an alta azimuth mount. And again, you're not gonna be responsible for those details, but just note that you can't just bolt a telescope down to the ground. The telescope has to move continuously for you to take images of the sky because the sky is always moving. It doesn't look like it's moving, but it is. So diffraction is the big bugaboo with all sorts of imaging. The diffraction is, comes from the fact that electromagnetic radiation is a wave, and as a wave, waves don't, don't stick to a single path. They kind of diffract around. So if this was a barrier, uh, the, the, the waves go through, but a small barrier with waves, the wave will bend out, and you can see the fuzziness of the images here. Um, we're not going to go into great detail about why this is, but I'll show you a short video. The thing you need to know is that the resolution, the distance between two objects is equal to this equation here, which is the wavelength over the diameter of the object. Uh, what this equation is saying is that as the wavelength of the light decreases, the resolution decreases. And in this case, a small resolution is good. What you want is uh, remember that um, the, uh, the sky is made up of 360 degrees. Each one of those degrees is made up of 60 arc minutes. The eye's resolution is about one arc minute. The sun and the moon are about 30 arc minutes across on the sky. Uh, and, the, and most telescopes have resolution. In other words, they can resolve uh, two objects that are about an arc second across, okay? And so what this equation is saying is that the bigger the telescope, and, this, uh, and the size of the telescope is designated by this D here, the smaller the resolution. In other words, the better the resolution because this number is small. So if I went from uh, a one meter telescope that had a resolution of one arc second, a two meter telescope would have a resolution of one half arc second. 
correspondingly, the wavelength, if the wavelength is halved, then the resolution was halved. If the wavelength is doubled, the resolution is doubled. Okay. Um, so the, the, the resolution is, is how well you can resolve two objects that are separated by a certain distance. Um, and so here's the, the video. The next thing I want to look at is what happens to a water wave when it passes through an aperture. Well, I fitted an aperture here, but it's rather too wide for what I need at the moment. So if I fit these sliding doors, I can make an aperture that's about, well, about three centimeters across. And if you now look at the screen, you can see that as the waves pass through the aperture, they spread out. This spreading out of a wave as it passes through an aperture is known as diffraction and it's a property of all types of waves. So what do you think controls how much the wave spreads out? Well, one possibility is the width of the aperture. And what do you think would happen if I made the aperture smaller? It would be like making the telescope smaller. Well, you might be surprised to learn that a narrower aperture leads to more spreading out of the wave, more diffraction. So the smaller the telescope, the more... If instead, I make the aperture wider, then after it's settled down, you can see that the wave becomes less spread out. The diffraction is less pronounced. And if I were to make the aperture very wide indeed, then there'd be hardly any diffraction. Well, I'm now going to return the aperture to its original width and take a look at the effect of changing the wavelength of the wave. Now remember, I can change the wavelength by altering the frequency of the paddle using this control here. If I make the wavelength longer, you can see that the waves become more spread out beyond the aperture, more diffraction. With a, a lower wavelength, and if I make the wavelength smaller again, the resolution gets worse. Here's where we started, then even shorter wavelength, then there's less diffraction. So here are the two separate factors that affect the diffraction of a wave passing through an aperture. The wave spreads out more if the aperture is made narrower or if the wavelength of the wave is increased. And conversely, it spreads out less with a wider aperture or a shorter wavelength. In fact, all kinds of waves, not just water waves, exhibit diffraction at an aperture, as long as the aperture is not too big. What I'm say in, in words is exactly this equation. If the wavelength gets small, the resolution gets small, which is good, better resolution. If the, um, the aperture, the size of the, in our case, the size of the telescope gets big, the resolution gets small, which is good, okay? So the resolution is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the size of the telescope. And again, we want high resolution because we want nice sharp images. We want to be able to separate those images on the, uh, on the night sky. Here's a graph that's complicated and hard to understand. But first of all, look at this. This is resolution of, of, uh, of the Andromeda galaxy at one arc second resolution, five arc seconds, one arc minute and 10 arc minutes. Okay, and you can see it just gets fuzzier here. This resolution, it, the, at the bottom here, we have the resolution and we go from 0 0.001 arc second, 0.1 arc second, one arc second, 10 arc second, 100 arc seconds. And remember the human eye is about here, okay? And most telescopes are about here. So about one arc minute and about one arc second, okay? Um, and up here is the size of that aperture, okay? So we go from a one millimeter aperture, the human eye is about 10 millimeters. So there is the human eye right there, all the way up to 10 meters, 100 meter, a kilometer. Uh, and then we have various telescopes here. So an eight inch telescope is here, a 16 inch telescope here, Hubble is up here. But this chart is more complicated because remember the resolution also depends on the frequency. And so here we have the frequency going off as this angle here. So down here are x-rays, ultraviolet. Here is the visible light. So if we just care about visible light, then as we 
uh, go up in in size, we go uh, down or better in resolution. Okay, so a ten meter telescope would have a theoretical resolution of 0 0.01 arc seconds, which is really really good. Okay, and this is just above what the James Webb Telescope is. Okay, but notice if we go to radio waves up here. Well, radio waves, so the Arecibo Observatory, which is 300 meters across, and the radio band uh, up here really doesn't have my, as good a resolution as the human eye, for example. Again, because it's dealing with such long wavelengths. Okay, so I know this chart is complicated, but it's very powerful. So, uh, so that's resolution. The other thing we care about with te telescopes is how much light it comes in. Because remember, we're dealing with very dim objects. And the light gathering power is just equal to the size of the telescope. And so it's equal, by size, I mean it's equal to the light gathering power is, is the physical surface area of the telescope mirror, the telescope lens. And the surface area is just equal to the diameter, is proportional to the diameter squared. So if I go from a one meter telescope to a two meter telescope, I will go from something that gathers a certain amount of light to four times that amount of light, the diameter squared. So the resolution goes as one over the diameter. Uh, so the bigger the diameter, the better the resolution. And also the bigger the diameter, the more light I get in by a factor of uh, the diameter squared. Uh, and so size matters. Bigger telescopes have better resolution and more light. And so you want as big as possible. So the Hubble Space Telescope is that little tiny thing down there. Uh, I'm writing a book on the, the LSST, which is right here, which is about this big. It's an eight meter telescope. I notice there's several eight meter telescopes. Eight meters is about 25 feet across. Uh, and then these, this is the 30 millimeter telescope that they're, there's so many protests about in, um, in Hawaii, and you can see how huge this is in. Again, because astronomers want big. They want big, big, big. And here's the James Webb Telescope, which will be going into outer space. And notice the Hubble isn't particularly big by, all of, by the standards here. Okay. Are most pictures we are looking at taken with, within the Earth's atmosphere or within, uh, within space outside the Earth's atmosphere? So if you're talking about posters you see in the wall, most of them are taken with Hubble. And although Hubble is not a particularly big telescope, it's outside the Earth's atmosphere, so it doesn't get the atmospheric distortion, which we'll be talking about in a minute. So what can we see on the surface of the Earth? Well, most of the Earth's atmosphere is, uh, the Earth's atmosphere blocks most of the electromagnetic radiation from outer space. The only two exceptions to that is visible light, which is good, so we can see, and radio waves. But infrared, ultraviolet, gamma rays, x-rays, they're all blocked, okay? And so anytime you see an image that's taken in one of these other bands, it's from uh, an, a telescope that's in outer space. But again, we can see from uh, the Earth, but the problem is we have the atmosphere. Now, if we didn't have an atmosphere, things would be really good for astronomers and things would be really bad for the rest of us because we'd all die. But detail. The, the problem with the atmosphere is it bounces light around. And so what should be a single image is great as a whole series of images because the atmosphere just distorts it. And you can see that distortion when you see the sun setting, okay? It's just a real problem. Uh, <laughs> and so even though you've paid a billion dollars for a ground-based telescope to have this incredible resolution, you can't get that resolution because the atmosphere distorts it. So how do you solve that? You solve it by using computers. By using computers, or you go to outer space. Both of these are very expensive. So we have what's known as adaptive optics. And adaptive optics, what they do, and by the way, here's an example of this. This is an image of Saturn without adaptive optics, and there's the image of Saturn with adaptive optics. What we do is we try to use computers to model what the atmosphere is doing and then have a deformable mirror that can be deformed thousands of times a second to basically reverse the distortion that the atmosphere caused. Um, how costly can telescopes of larger size be? So the telescope I'm writing about, the LSST, costs about a billion dollars. Uh, of, of that billion dollars, uh, about 400 million of that is the camera itself, which made the news just yesterday. Um, 
So you're telling me there's a dancing mirror in the telescopes. That's exactly right. Not in the LSST, but in a lot of these other mega telescopes, they will have a dancing mirror. That's a good description of it. So they'll, they'll, what they'll do is they'll take a look at a particular guide star that they know should be just a point source. And then if that point source bounces around, they use the computers to figure out how it bounced around and then deform the mirror to remove that bounce. If there's no guide star around, what they do is they will shoot a laser up into the atmosphere. The laser will be reflected off of a very high level of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. And then they use the laser as basically an artificial guide star to create the undistorted view by distorting a mirror that can be deformed at thousands of times a second. Uh, this is a, a very, very advanced technique. It's been around for about 20 years and now it's become much more uh, popular. Okay, so the other way that we get rid of that distortion is by sending things into outer space. We send things in outer space partly for resolution, but partly because most of the interesting electromagnetic bands uh, are just not available to us because uh, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs them. Uh, so we have SOFIA, which uses a 747 to try and get above most of the atmosphere so they can take infrared pictures. And then we have a whole series of telescopes in ultraviolet, in uh, 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 infrared, in radio, in gamma rays, and in x-rays, so we can see those that we couldn't normally do it. The Hubble Space Telescope's been up since 1990. It's almost 30 years old, and it's still operating, which is just kind of amazing. It, it's mostly a visible telescope, but again, because above the Earth's atmosphere, its resolution is, is really good. The James Webb Telescope, which will be launched in 2018, I'm sorry, 2019, I'm sorry, 2020, I'm sorry, 2022. Uh, it will be launched someday. Uh, it's been delayed so often, it's just beyond belief. Anyway, it's, I think it's up to $5 billion at this point. It will be the replacement for the uh, Hubble, and it's several times larger than that. This is your telescope, an engineering marvel, an exploration powerhouse. Use it to look back in time and explore the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang, to peer into atmospheres of planets orbiting the stars. It's your eyepiece to the uncharted, unknown, and unimagined. This is the largest, most complex, and challenging space telescope ever constructed. It will change our understanding of the universe and our place in it. The James Webb Space Telescope. Equipped with the largest primary mirror ever to be flown in space, at six and a half meters, it's more than six times the size of the Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror. Webb's four cutting edge infrared instruments and cameras operate at super cold temperatures. Temperatures colder than the surface of Pluto. Getting this cold is done with the help of the largest sun shield ever flown, a five layer, tennis court sized sun shield that blocks heat from the sun, earth, and moon. Webb will be the first telescope to detect light from the most distant galaxies in the universe. These first galaxies formed about 13 and a half billion years ago, only 300 or so million years after the Big Bang. Webb carries advanced technologies to tackle some of the most fundamental questions about the universe. How did the first galaxies form and evolve? Are there chemical signatures of the building blocks of life on other worlds? Is our solar system unique? Launching such a large telescope into space is an incredible engineering challenge. Fully deployed, Webb is too large to fit inside any rocket fairing. Engineers designed it to be folded, like origami, to squeeze inside the European Space Agency's five meter diameter Arian 5 rocket fairing. After launch, controllers on the ground deploy Webb remotely. Deployment is an intricate ballet. 
For nearly three weeks, controllers carefully unfold web. After this delicate dance, web's golden mirrors are precisely aligned using motors behind each hexagonal mirror segment adjusting them to form one perfect mirror. Once the instruments are fully cooled, the exploration will begin. Web is a technological challenge like no other, born of the efforts of thousands of people across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The James Webb Space Telescope is your telescope. Use it to explore, to challenge theories, to see sights yet unseen. It's yours to unfold the beauty and mystery in the universe and our place in it. Okay, uh, I'm out of time, so I'm open for questions. You're welcome to turn your mic on. Uh, let me answer the questions that have been in, in there. Ryan says, why do astronomers, uh, what do astronomers on the ISS do? It seems like they would get bored. Well, as far as I know, there aren't any astronomers on the ISS and never have been. There are people who will run astronomical telescopes. So my advisor worked on what's not nicer, which was a telescope that is on the ISS currently, but it operates remotely. The, the, um, the uh, astronauts did have to do a spacewalk to install it on one of the trusses, but after that, they, they're not that involved. And uh, in terms of the astronauts on the ISS, they most definitely are not bored. They, in fact, the problem with the astronauts on the ISS is that every minute of their time is worth the millions. And I mean that literally. And so the astronauts typically are, are, are programmed, their time is programmed to the minute because um, the, the time on the ISS is so valuable. And in fact, the problem and the time is spent uh, doing experiments, but you know, again, there's hundreds of experiments up there, and they're just given a checklist of things they need to do to operate those experiments. And a lot of those experiments are biological, but some of them are astronomical. Um, a lot of their tasks have to do with just maintenance of the ISS itself, which is a, a very, very difficult. One of the greatest things we're learning is how can we live in space? Uh, and then they have uh, various medical um, experiments on themselves. You know, how does the human body adapt to that? Uh, in fact, the the timing of astronauts is so fraught with peril that in the early days of the uh, space age, uh, when they sent up what's known as Space Lab, which was a precursor to the ISS, the astronauts went on strike, which is not widely known. Uh, so uh, why are the mirrors golden? Uh, I don't know that question. Um, that, that's a real good question. Now, the, the thing about the James Webb is it doesn't, it's not visible light, it's infrared. Um, it's infrared because, well, we'll get into this, but the most interesting things in the universe, the things that are farthest away from us, are broadcast their light in infrared light, not invisible light. And the other thing is because uh, infrared light has a much longer wavelength, the precision that you need uh, the mirrors to to align with is is actually greatly reduced, uh, and so that that sort of hexagonal shape would be difficult to do in space with visible light, but it's easier with uh, with the ISS. But why it's gold, I don't know. Uh, but again, because we're not taking color images with uh, visible light, uh, the fact that it's made of gold probably doesn't matter. It's it, it, you know you don't need to worry about coloring the images. Why are they making hazmat suits while wearing it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. The, the problem is that dust on, on telescopes is, is the bane of existence of every astronomer. And so, for example, the, uh, the telescope I'm working on called the ISS, every two years, they have to take down the telescope mirror shave it down and re-mirror re, uh, re it because dust accumulates on the, uh, um, uh, on the mirror itself and degrades the image. And certainly you can clean it and they are, it is clean periodically, but at some point the, the scratches caused by that dust creates a real problem. In outer space, you can't take down the mirror and clean it. And, and so every little tiny piece of dust, I mean, you're talking about something that costs, you know, $5 billion. You don't want a few grains of dust to degrade any of the resolution you just paid $5 billion for. And so that's why everybody wears those hazmat suits, that, why they have incredibly clean air. You don't want any dust at all anywhere near that telescope. 
Um, apparently, it, uh, because of COVID, it's been pushed back to October 2021. Yeah, um, if it goes up in October 2021, I'd, I'll, I'll hold a celebration party for all of you. I, it just... It's been just one problem after another. Are other countries trying to put large telescopes in space too? Or are we all working together for this one? Well, as they said, the James Webb is a collaboration between the uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, Canada, and us. And so these projects are so expensive, there's a lot of collaboration. For instance, the ISS, literally, International Space Station is collaboration between uh, the major partners, of course, the United States and Russia, and the minor partners are virtually other, every other uh, uh, country on the planet. So where did they get $5 billion to build the telescope? Well, so the telescope has been in, uh, uh, has been a project for 20 years, over 20 years. Uh, and so it's not like th somebody wrote a check for $5 billion. And I think the original budget was closer to a billion. Uh, it, you know, it just comes out of their yearly budget. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that's almost a drop in the bucket in NASA's budget because the most of NASA's money goes for manned spaceflight. I'm sorry, human spaceflight. Um, so we're learning a lot from the ISS and humans in space, but boy, it's it's very expensive. So for example, Christina Cook, the, uh, uh, the astronaut from our department who uh, just spent most of the time in space, uh, almost a year up there, every day she spent up there, was $10 million every day. Uh, and we come up with that figure, not because of her personally, but we just take six astronauts, uh, calculate how much money it costs to keep the ISS operating, divided by six. Uh, how do telescopes avoid space debris? Oh, yeah, that's a really good problem. I, I'm sorry, it's a horrible problem. It's a, it's a good question. Um, so the, uh, the Air Force, uh, at the uh, Shan, Wyoming, has a um, uh, the international. I'm sorry, the United States Space Force uh, tracks objects down to the size of of uh, my finger thumb, my thumb, in outer space. They track something like ten thousand objects. I forget the exact number, but they track a huge number of objects. And whenever an object is going to get too close to um, the space station or uh, a major telescope, such as Hubble then they tell the operators to move the telescope or the ISS. And so the ISS has moved several times to avoid space debris. The problem is they can't track down to the smallest object. And even something that is almost invisible, something the size of a grain of sand, um, could destroy a telescope because it's moving at you know, 18,000 miles an hour. Um, and there's really no avoiding that. And so... Believe it or not, the ISS is pointed in the direction where it has actually shielding in the direction of, of motion uh, to, to really try and minimize a fatal impact from, from objects that are too small to be tracked. Uh, and I don't know if the Hubble has any of that, but most other objects that are in low Earth orbit will have some sort of barrier uh, in the direction of orbit to try and just cut down the, the potential damage. Uh, is there any particular phenomenon that ast astronomers are hoping to observe with the James Webb? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the beginnings of the universe. Uh, the James Webb is optimized for uh, very, uh, very dim infrared objects. And very dim infrared objects is the galaxies and the stars that were at the very beginnings of our universe. And that's what the, uh, that's what the uh, James Webb is, is really good for. And that's what we're really interested in because understanding how the universe was created will tell us a lot about how the universe works now and tells us a lot about the forces of nature that we're trying to understand now. Uh, we're kind of at a crisis point in physics and astronomy because we have so much evidence that we just, there's a lot that we just don't understand. Uh, dark matter, dark energy, cosmic uh, accelerations, all of these are questions that make us question what we know about the makeup of our universe uh, and also make us uh, question what, uh, you know, how the universe was created and how the universe operates. And only by understanding the beginnings of the universe can we truly understand what that is. And the James Webb is optimized for that. What do you think of Netflix's TV show Space uh, Force? I think it's a hoot. 
Um, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's amusingly wildly inaccurate, but they do so knowing they're wildly inaccurate. It's, it's, it's a, it's a sitcom and I just think it's a hoot and they don't make any, uh, um, bones about the fact that it, it has no bearings with reality. For instance, the United States would never do major launches in the center of the country. Uh, the reason why is that when things don't work right, they fall down on populated areas. Uh, also in the latest episode they had, uh, trying to set up a permanent moon colony, you know, with a single shot. Yeah, that's amusing. But yeah, it's a hoot. I like I like it. Uh, other questions? Okay, uh, I know this is dense. I had a bunch of questions I wasn't able to get to. Um, that's a nice smiley face. That's cute. I wasn't able to get to here. So uh, I'll see you guys on Tuesday where we'll talk more about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, can we watch it as a class? <laughs> that would be a hoot. Yes. <laughs> I wish we had the time to do that. Anyway, thanks so much. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Bye-bye.